Well, hello, everybody. Jeremy Myers here again. It's that time, so we are going to do a live streaming of my One Verse podcast as I seek to record it here on Facebook Live. And uh, we'll be teaching you about 1 John 1, 7 through 9 this week. So um, thanks for joining me. And the way this is going to work, the way this always works every week, is I record it live. And because of that, uh, I have my notes in the screen in front of me, right beneath the camera. Uh, and therefore, they are hiding the Facebook page that you're watching. And so if you want to interact with me or ask questions or make comments, feel free to do that. Uh, however, you're watching this on the comments below or maybe off to the side or something. And then after I'm done recording it, I will bring that screen back up and uh, respond to any comments that you might have. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Vernon. Thank you for joining me very much. And um, anybody else who comes along as well. Also, there's a bit of a lag. I'm not quite sure how much. Uh, what you're seeing, I think, is probably about... I don't know, five to 10 seconds behind what I'm saying. So if you leave a comment or question, even right now here at the beginning, or you join and I don't say hi to you right away, uh, it's because you haven't popped up on my screen yet. For example, Ron, you just joined me. Thanks, Ron. And uh, so uh, again, I don't know how long you've been on there already. Anyway, all this technical stuff, it's fun, isn't it? And I'm still trying to figure this out on my own as well. So uh, anyway, thanks for joining me. And I don't know, uh, hi, John, I don't know if you have any questions right off the bat about 1 John 1, 9. Really, the question is about how the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. I'm not sure if that has ever been your question or if you've ever had discussions about that. But that is what we will be discussing in today's uh, One Verse podcast episode as I record it live here on Facebook. All right. So, um Let's see. I am just going to uh, put this Facebook screen over on the side. You know, it's weird. I just have a blank screen on uh, Facebook here that's showing no image at all. Uh, if you're watching this, can you just let me know that you do see something on your screen? Because for me, it's just black. Um, and if you see the if you see the image, then I am just going to say, OK, thumbs up and I will I will go ahead. So uh, it looks like. Oh, thanks, Ron. So it looks like it's about a 30 second delay. Wow. Uh, that's quite a bit. So um, I, I guess it'll take about 30 seconds for somebody to say whether or not you're seeing something on that screen, which is just blank for me. Black again. I don't know why. Technology. Got to love it. Right. Um, hi, Pete. Hi, Danny. Okay, anybody else uh, able to see anything on that screen? Give me a thumbs up or let me know that you're seeing it. If so. Okay, thanks, Bonnie. It's been doing that lately, but we see you. <laughs> okay, fantastic. All right, so Bonnie can see me. Hopefully the rest of you can as well. And uh, that means that uh, we're just going to go ahead with recording this, this podcast episode. All right, I got to do a little technical stuff over here on the side. As I get my recorder set up and my sound ready to go and my notes up in front of me, should have done this all before I got going here. Okay, so that's up and running. That's up and running. Okay, here we go. Live recording of the One Verse podcast as we look at 1 John 1, 7 through 10. This is the One Verse Podcast, where we liberate scripture from religion, one verse at a time. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the One Verse Podcast want to let you know that what we'll be talking about today is sort of a summary of some of the things that we discuss or I teach in my online course, The Gospel Dictionary. Eventually, that course will be turned into a book, maybe three volumes, with how much information I have in there. But that's a ways down the road. So right now, if you want to get some of this content, you're going to have to take the online course, The Gospel Dictionary. And there's an easy way to do that. You just have to join my online discipleship group. The course itself sells for $297. Please don't pay that. 
Uh, that's just the, the, what I put the price at and the value of it with how much hundreds of hours of teaching will be in that course eventually. Um, but you can join the discipleship group for $9 a month right now, and you get access to all of my courses that way, as well as access to our private Facebook discipleship group and uh, monthly video chats and a whole bunch of other things. So anyway, to learn more, just go to redeeminggod.com slash join, okay? And uh, so some of what we'll be teaching today is from that course, a summary of it anyway. All right. And also one of the discipleship group members sent in the question for today's podcast episode. So that's uh, another benefit that you get for being part of that group. In fact, last night we had our Facebook uh, live video chat and we discussed the topic of hell. So I was able to record that discussion and it also is in the group. So if you're part of the online discipleship group, Go to our, our Facebook page and you can listen in and even watch to our, it was about a 40-minute discussion of hell, some of the passages related to hell. So if you have questions about hell, who goes to hell, what hell is, what the Bible teaches about hell, or maybe doesn't teach about hell, then uh, that video is there for you to watch and listen to as well. So with all of that in mind, let's dive into our study today of 1 John 1, 7-10. So one of the members of the online discipleship group recently asked me about 1 John 1, 7-10, and how the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. Here's what he wrote. It's from Eli. Eli, if you're watching or listening, thank you for your question. Here's what he wrote. I really appreciate your ministry and have been blessed by your books. Thanks, Eli. I have a question for you regarding 1 John 1, 7, where it says, The blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. I've just listened to your podcast about the two different words for forgiveness, but I'm wondering how this verse plays into it all since it uses the word cleanses. What do I need to know to understand this well? All right. Well, thank you for the question, Eli. And I did let you know by email that uh, I would be responding to this question in our podcast today. So uh, you'll get this and as well as the notes I sent you by email. Anyway, uh, First John, and I'm, I'm recording this because I know lots of other people have the same question. All right, so First John 1, 7 through 10, uh, it does get discussed in various ways in my Gospel Dictionary online course. So Eli, if you're part of the, uh, uh, if, you've, if you've signed up to take that course for free as part of the discipleship group, then uh, probably the lessons you want to take right now are lessons on uh, the word blood and the word confess. Now, Fairly soon, I will be adding a lesson on the word fellowship because that also is important. And then a little bit after that, I will be adding a lesson on the word forgiveness. And that also is important for this context, for this text. Uh, eventually, I will also be adding the a study on the word sin. Okay, and so all of those words, uh, blood, confess, fellowship, forgiveness, and sin, they're all mentioned here in 1 John 1, 7-10, and so they are critical to understand those words if you want to understand this text. Now, it, it's going to take me a while, I will, I will admit, to get to the word sin. So if you want to know more about the word sin, a lot of that is found in my book, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. So I do discuss, I have two whole chapters on the word sin, what the Bible teaches about sin. Now, for those of you who aren't in the discipleship group or Eli, if you haven't had a chance to take that course yet, that's fine. I'm going to summarize in this podcast episode some of what I teach in that course and in the book, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, okay? Uh, to begin with, though, let's just read 1 John 1. Uh, let's just read verses 7 and 9, since those two verses include this phrase, confess. All right, here's the pertinent verses. They say, but if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, so there's these five key terms in these verses which we need to understand, we need to properly define, if we are going to understand this text. All right, and the words here are sin, blood, of course, blood of Jesus, the word confess, the word forgive, and then, of course, the word cleanse as well. So let's, let's just briefly try to define all five, beginning with the word sin. 
All right, so what is sin? Well, obviously, John writes over in uh, 1 John 3, 4 that sin is lawlessness. And so lots of people think, well, sin is whenever you break the law. And that's true. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. I'm not going to disagree with John either. But you need to understand uh, why the law was given in the first place and uh, therefore how sin is lawlessness and what breaking the law leads to. It's not necessarily uh, that the law was given because God just came up with some random laws uh, to give people to to follow and obey, just to give them something to do, right? No, uh, there is something behind the law or at the root of the law uh, or at the foundation of the law that God was trying to stop, that God was trying to put an end to. And uh, it is that sin, this foundational, fundamental behavior and practices of sin that has plagued humanity since the foundation of the world uh, and that is, is forms the foundation of why the law was given in the first place. And ultimately, what is that? Well, it's what we see in uh, Genesis chapter 4 when Cain murders his brother Abel. Right there is the first time sin is mentioned in the Bible. And uh, by the way, in, in the podcast, uh, previous podcast episodes, we did a study of Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 4. So you can go listen to those and uh, get some background information on why Cain killed his brother Abel, and why that passage, that chapter, is so important for understanding sin in the rest of the Bible. Bottom line is, though, sin in the Bible is when we humans engage in any practice or any sort of behavior that causes us to accuse, condemn, uh, scapegoat, exile, cast out, uh, and ultimately kill other people. And we do all of this in the name of God. Because we think God wants us to do it, that God is on our side, that God condemns them as much as we condemn them. All right. And, and that idea is that sort of uh, circle of concepts is what the Bible has in mind when it talks about sin. All right. It's this ancient and universal, fundamental, foundational human practice that we all do of wrongly accusing, condemning, scapegoating, and killing others in God's name. All right? That's sin. This helps us then understand what is meant by the blood of Jesus. This is the second key phrase, key term in 1 John 1 that we need to understand. All right? Here's what happens. Few people actually recognize how they engage in the practice of sin, of wrongly accusing, condemning, and scapegoating other people. All right? What happens is we believe, we humans believe, that our judgments of other people are right and just, valid, correct, right? We condemn other people because, oh, look at those sinners, those evil people over there. Look at all the bad things they're doing. They are under the judgment of God. They, you know, should die. They need to go spend eternity in hell or whatever. And we make these judgments on them based on a variety of factors. But we think when we do that, that we are making right judgments, that we are making correct accusations and judgments of them. All right? What happened when Jesus went to the cross, when Jesus was crucified, is that it was revealed to us, because we, we accused him, the people at that time accused him, condemned him, called him a blasphemer under the judgment of God. All right? And we condemned him, we made him a scapegoat, and ultimately, he was the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. We killed him, we crucified him on the cross. And in this way, it was discovered, it was revealed to us, that just as we took someone who was completely innocent of any wrongdoing, and we accused and condemned and, and, and killed him, this is also what we do to everybody else that we accuse, condemn, scapegoat, and even kill in the name of God. Jesus was killed in the name of God. The people believed they were doing God's will when they killed Jesus. Right? And that is what the blood of Jesus reveals to us. But we don't want to admit it. We don't want to agree. We don't want to see this in our own actions. Again, we think our actions, our judgments of others, are right and just and fair and correct and godly. All right? But in Jesus, we see, no, <laughs> that's not always the case. In fact, that rarely is the case. Yes, 
in other people, because they do sin, we feel like our judgments are just. But the thing is, is usually what happens is although they are guilty of some of the things that we accuse them of, what we do is we amplify their guilt and and we, we, we take their one little sin and we explode it up into all these others so that we can turn them into a monster, so that we can, we can dehumanize them and therefore call for their death, call for them to be killed in God's name, say that God is against them, so so are we, and so we march off to war and we point our guns and we drop our bombs because those evil sinners over there are under the judgment of God, right? That's what happens. Though they may be guilty of some of the things we accuse them of, People are never guilty of everything that we accuse them of. And that is what the blood of Jesus reveals to us. Jesus was guilty for nothing, but we made him into a sinner, the worst sinner, a blasphemer, under the judgment of God. And that's what we do to other people as well. And that is what the blood of Jesus reveals to us. Okay, And we need to recognize our involvement with that. So that's the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus reveals that to us. This brings us then... To the third key term in 1 John 1, 7 through 10, which is the term of confession. All right. The word confess means to agree. Uh, If we agree, we need to agree. And so when Jesus revealed the truth to us by his shed blood on the cross, ultimately we are faced with a choice. We can either agree with what Jesus revealed by his blood or we can disagree, right? We can either confess or we can deny that when we accuse others, condemn others, judge others, call for the death of others, right, that we're doing this rightly or wrongly. We can either confess, yeah, I do that. I, I have wrongly accused others, as revealed in Jesus. Or we can deny, no, I don't do that. My judgments are just. I always make right and accurate judgments based on the law of God and the standards of righteousness, you know, those sorts of things that we sometimes uh, fall into. And I have myself, I still do, quite often. All right? So uh, this is what confession is about in 1 John 1, 7 through 10. Jesus has revealed it by his blood, so now the question is, do you agree or do you deny that you engage in such such practices? By the way, uh, John says, if we deny that we're involved in such practices, <laughs> then we're lying. We're deceiving ourselves. We're calling God a liar. No, God, you're wrong. I don't do that. Mm, be careful. <laughs> All right? Uh, if we deny that we're involved in such practices, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We've not yet recognized the truth of what Jesus revealed. All right, fourth then, forgiveness. Uh, Eli did mention that he heard my podcast episode on the two types of forgiveness. And uh, I do talk about that, or I will be talking about that a lot more in my my course, The Gospel Dictionary. I think I even talk about it in my book, uh, The Atonement of God. And, of course, I'm going to be having a book eventually come out, which is uh, only on the topic of forgiveness. So we will be uh, uh, explaining, I will be explaining forgiveness a whole lot more in that book. But there's, I have several, uh, if, if you just can't wait, I have several Uh, blog posts right now available that you can read uh, on my blog. Just go to Google, search for two types of forgiveness, uh, redeeminggod.com or something like that, two types of forgiveness, Jeremy Myers, and you'll find a couple articles where I I, I present to you the two types of forgiveness. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast last couple of weeks, I bring this up every single time because it's so important for you to understand. There's two types of forgiveness in the Bible. Uh, The first is based on the Greek word charizoma. It's based on uh, which is which comes from the root charis, uh, the root charis, uh, which is translated grace. So this is the gracious, free, gracious forgiveness of God. Okay, charizomai forgiveness is it's free and universal. It's extended by God to every person on planet Earth, past, present, and future for all their sins, past, present, and future. There's no conditions, no strings. It's just because God is loving and gracious. He freely forgives everybody. That's charizomai forgiveness. The second type of forgiveness is aphasis forgiveness. And uh, this type of forgiveness often has conditions attached to it. Aphasis forgiveness is uh, what we need to do in order to experience in this life a release, a deliverance from our addictive behaviors, our destructive actions, 
um, the, th the ways that we hurt ourselves and hurt other people through our beliefs and our behaviors and our actions, okay? And so there's conditions attached. This is not a free forgiveness. And uh, you must do certain things in order to experience this forgiveness and therefore break free from sin. So though God can freely forgive us of all our sins, past, present, and future, this doesn't necessarily automatically lead to us breaking free from our sin. That's what a faces forgiveness is for. It's the experience in this life of the forgiveness that God has already extended to us freely. Okay? And there's conditions attached. We must do things. There's steps involved. Okay? One of those in the context here as we're reading is confession. All right? If we want to break free from this pattern of sin, we need to confess it and agree. And if we do that, then we will be forgiven. That is, we will be released set free, delivered from our addiction and bondage and slavery to all of that type of sin. All right? That then brings us to the fifth and final key word we need to understand in 1 John 1, 7-10, which ultimately gets us back to, your, to Eli's question. What about the cleansing? Look, when we agree and confess and admit and do not deny that, yes, yeah, sometimes we wrongly accuse, judge, scapegoat, cast out, exile, condemn other people, and we do this in God's name, when we agree that Jesus revealed this to us and he's given us a glimpse into our own heart, it's then that we see the different way of Jesus, the way of love, the way of grace, the way of mercy, the way of forgiveness. And when we see that in Jesus... It's then that we can start living in a different way towards other people as well. And that brings about the cleansing, all right? Our lives, our present lives and our future lives are cleansed from living that old way any longer. Right? It's not a spiritual cleansing. It's, it's not, it's not um, uh, God washing our spirits or our souls away, uh, free of that sin. No, th th that's not what's happening here with the reference to cleansing. All right? It's a change of our actual behaviors starting now and going forward. All right? As we are cleansed in this way, and this is what John writes, as we're cleansed in this way, we will have fellowship with God and with one another. <laughs> we'll be friends with God and friends with one another because we'll be living on the same page. We'll be doing the same thing, walking in the same direction. Okay? So those are the five key terms, and I think it sort of helps you understand. Let me give you sort of an amplified summary of 1 John 1, 7-10 with all of these five key terms in mind. All right? Here's how you can understand 1 John 1, 7-10. God walks in the light, and we can walk in the light with him if we agree with the light of the truth that he has revealed. When we live in light of this, this truth, we will live in peace with God and with each other, and we'll no longer engage in the sinful practices of accusing, condemning, scapegoating others, which was revealed through the blood of Jesus. When we turn from such practices... We will be cleansed from living in such violent ways. Of course, not everybody wants to admit they engage in such practices. We humans tend to think that our judgments of others are just, that our accusations of them have the backing and support of God. But if we believe this way, then we are simply deceiving ourselves and have not yet understood the truth. However, if we agree that we do indeed engage in sinful practices revealed through the bloody death of Jesus on the cross, then God is faithful and just and will help us gain deliverance and freedom from our bondage and enslavement to these practices. And he will stop, he will help us stop engaging in them any longer. God has freely forgiven us for all those sins, but if we want to practically be cleansed from them, we need to admit that we engage in them and then follow the example and teachings of Jesus and how to live with love and free, free forgiveness instead. So once again, if you deny that you engage in this basic human practice of accusing, condemning, and scapegoating others, if you think that the people you call monsters and heretics truly are guilty of everything you accuse them of, Right? If you think that some people truly deserve to burn in hell for all eternity, if you think that war is righteous and good and we need to bomb some groups of evil people off the face of the planet, 
then you are calling God a liar. And you have not understood the first thing about God and what he taught through Jesus. Okay, so that was a long extended paraphrase summary of 1 John 1, 7 through 10. And I think you saw as I went through that, sort of how the, the, the themes of, of those five key words fit into what John is saying. All right, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. It exposes sin for what it is and then calls us to live a different way, a way separate from sacred violence, redemptive violence, thinking that we can solve things through violence. The blood of Jesus cleanses us by calling us to practice nonviolence. All right, and it's not a spiritual antidote. It's not like it's tied or something that, 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 comes in and magically washes the blackness of sin away from our souls. That's not what's happening. This is something more practical and real world living issues here. Okay. It exposes our, the blood of Jesus exposes our sacred violence to us and then shows us how we judge and condemn other people and says, stop it. (laughs) Don't do that anymore. Instead, walk in the light of Jesus and have fellowship with him and with one another. Of course, as John goes on to explain, if we deny this, what, what, if we deny what Jesus reveals to us, if we say we don't do that, that we're not guilty of that, then we simply are calling God a liar, and uh, we have not seen the truth about what the blood of Jesus reveals to us. We have not owned up to our duplicity, our participation in human scapegoating and violence. Only once we admit it, and own up to our role in making victims of others, can we be cleansed from it and live in fellowship with God and others? Now, Eli and I went back and forth a little bit by email on uh, this this uh, sort of way of understanding 1 John 1, 7 through 10. And he did come back with a very, very good question. What about past sins? He says, I can understand how this way of living, what we see through the blood of Jesus, helps us with our current sins and our future sins, how we kill and condemn and scapegoat others. But what about those past sins, the ones we've already done, the ones that, you know, maybe we're looking back to some of our behaviors in the past and how we condemned and accused and judged others. How does the blood of Jesus help us with that? Here's the answer. Well, let me back up. First of all, from 1 John, there is no answer, at least not here in these verses. John is not talking about our past sins here in these verses. He's only concerned with our present behavior and our future behavior. He's looking now in our life and forward. He's not looking to the past. So that's the first thing. He's primarily interested in making sure his readers recognize how they're doing this now and Make a commitment to stop doing it in the future. Okay? So that's the first answer. John is not talking about our past sins. And we could get into the Greek on this. We could get into the the word for cleansing here is subjunctive mood. You guys don't care about that. If you do, I got a note uh, you can read on the uh, show notes for this podcast episode. You can probably just search Google for 1 John 1, 7 through 10, redeeminggod.com, and it will come up. If you're listening to this live on Facebook, you won't, you're not, it's not there yet. I haven't published it yet, but it will be here in about half an hour, an hour or so on uh, April 18th. Okay. Anyway, uh, the, the Greek shows us that, that, that John is only concerned about present sin and future sin, not past sin. So what does that mean? Does that mean that our past sins were not cleansed from those? Right? What is the blood of Jesus? How does, how does the blood of Jesus help us with those? Ah, good question. Well, other passages in the New Testament, especially those from Paul, say that we've been freely forgiven of those, just like God will freely forgive us of all of our future sins as well. Uh, Romans 3, 25 to 26, he's been passed over the sins. God has passed over the sins previously committed. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, okay? Uh, God does not count our sins against us, which, which raises the question, why do we? If God's not counting our sins against us, why do we count sins against other people? Anyway, and then Colossians 2.13, where God freely forgives us for our sins. All right, so it goes back to this concept of God's charizomai forgiveness. You have been, if we could use the word cleansing, I'm not sure it's exactly accurate in this context, uh, but if we wanted to use the word cleansing, 
God has freely cleansed us, forgiven us of all of our sins, past, present, and future. We've been wiped clean. All right? And uh, so, but he does want us to change our behaviors going forward, cleansing our actions and our behaviors towards other people. All right? So how do we do that again? 1 John 1, 7, 8, 9, 10. Admit, agree that you're involvement in this. And then learn what we can from the blood of Jesus about how to live differently going forward. All right, so let me just in closing give you sort of three suggestions on how to live as we go forward. First, and especially what we learn from 1 John 1, 7 through 10. First of all, do you see what is revealed in the violent and bloody death of Jesus? Do you see how he revealed the truth that we humans accuse, condemn, scapegoat, and even kill, or at least call for the killing of other people in God's name? But none of this has anything to do with God and, in fact, is the exact opposite of what God wants or desires. That's the first thing. You need to agree and see and admit, yeah, this is the way I live. This is what I've done. All right, if you don't agree with that or haven't seen that, then really 1 John 1, 7 through 10 uh, doesn't have much else to say to you except, <laughs> except for calling you a liar, and you need to, you need to see that before you can, can move on. Second, if you've seen that, then do you agree that you have engaged and might be engaged in some of these practices today? And you say, no, I don't do that. All right. I don't know what your position is on what's going on in the world today, politically or financially or some of these other things. But, you know, do you condemn uh, Muslims? Oh, they're all terrorists. Well, no, they're not. Okay, let's not turn them into monsters so that we can justify our violence towards them. You know, some people, um, I think that in some circles, uh, LGBT, you know, gay people, um, they are the scapegoats. We condemn them. Oh, our society and culture is going to hell because of the gays. Come on, really? Some people condemn the Democrats or the Republicans or President Trump or Hillary Clinton or the media (laughs) or your boss or your neighbor or whomever. All right, some of them might be guilty of some of the things that we accuse them of, but they're not guilty of everything. All right, and third and finally, if you recognize that you do indeed engage in some of these practices, then what are you going to do about it? How are you going to change? What decisions and behaviors are going to make that will cleanse you from these sort of practices in the future? And the answer to that question is what the rest of 1 John is all about. John wrote this letter, he presented this problem right at the very beginning, and then in the next four chapters he lays out how to change, how to love, how to forgive, how to walk in the light. That's what 1 John is all about. And I don't have time in this podcast episode to go through all of that, so I will let you read that on your own. Bottom line is, though, if you want to change your behavior, you've got to live the way God lives, which is with unconditional love and free forgiveness towards yourself and towards other people. All right, we'll save all that for another study, though. Look, if you have comments or questions, I encourage you to leave them on my blog or on Facebook or wherever you might be watching or listening to this. Send me an email. Contact me through my website. Also, join the online discipleship group if you feel so inclined. We have almost daily discussions about this in the closed Facebook group. People ask their questions, and we have a great little community there where we help each other discuss questions, even help each other with some practical issues and concerns in life. So if that's, looks, if that's something that you think would be helpful for you, you can uh, learn more and join by going to redeeminggod.com slash join. Thank you so much for listening to today, and I think that next week... Uh, We will probably move on from blood and talk about the word baptism or something like that. So uh, we'll see where we're at in next week's podcast episode, looking at another passage from Scripture and how to understand it in light of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Thank you so much for listening today. See you next time. And remember, may your life and theology always look more and more like Jesus Christ.
Okay, I think that's about it for the outro music. I am going to minimize my notes I was going off of there and pull the Facebook page back over. All right, let's go through here. Looks like I have 15 comments. Several people still watching. Let me scroll back up here through the comments if I can. Okay, yeah, one was uh, early on, Ron, uh, thinking or telling me that uh, there was a delay for 30 seconds, and then Bonnie said, you can't actually see the the video. I still can't see it. It's just a blank screen for me. I don't know if that's normal. Um, okay, uh, Franny, hi, Franny, says, uh, and, and Paula, it looks like, says, uh, I'm guessing thumbs up, and they can see me. That's good. Okay, so a lot of these comments were just that initial question at the beginning. Uh, we see you, but nothing else. Okay, yeah, I wasn't trying to display another image, Bonnie. Um, just my, I don't, <laughs> I'm not good enough yet to be able to do that. Eventually, what I would like to do is is show you my screen, maybe pull up some Greek or Hebrew or something, show you sort of some of my study notes and how, how I come to these conclusions, give you some even further in-depth background details on some of what I'm teaching. But I don't have that, that, uh, technological expertise yet so uh, anyway sometime sometime we'll figure that out later hi jason jim uh, radu okay eli thanks for doing this oh sure sure eli oh hi <laughs> uh, that's eli he um he was listening live as i was on here thanks for thanks for watching eli and i will try to i hope you'll get the podcast episode since you are subscribing to it on itunes or wherever is you're subscribing it to and uh, if you miss some of it we'll get the full explanation all right, Debbie, uh, just finished your book. Oh, Rejustification of God. Oh, thanks, Debbie. Oh, and she says she's going to leave a review. Thank you so much. Listen, if you if you have read one of my books, a review on Amazon is extremely helpful and beneficial uh, because then that helps other people know what the book is about. And also something in Amazon's algorithm, it, it tells them, hey, people like this book, and uh, so they show it to more people. So that's very helpful. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, thank you, anybody else who, who decides to go leave a review. It really, really is encouraging to me and, and helpful. Uh, Bonnie, so helpful. Thank you. Okay, so no questions yet. All right, here's one from Debbie, it looks like. I did miss part of the beginning of this one. I've always understood that First John was about day-to-day -day sins and not our actual once and for all forgiveness when we come to Jesus. It sounds like you are removing the mystical power of the blood of Jesus. Not sure if that's what you mean. Jesus' blood is miraculous. I can see how your perspective removes the possible interpretation that Catholics believe about communion. Okay, well, um, let's see how to start with this. I, I did miss part of the beginning and not actual once and for all forgiveness when we come to Jesus. All right, so I do know that uh, traditionally uh, it, it is taught that your sins are not forgiven by God until you believe in Jesus for eternal life. And then at that point, all of your sins, past, present, and, and in some traditions, uh, even future sins, are forgiven. And so the ongoing forgiveness here in, in 1 John 1, 7 through 10, is sort of for daily cleansing and purification, uh, that sort of thing. Honestly, I don't have a problem with that view necessarily. If you don't buy into this whole concept of the blood of Jesus that I'm trying to defend uh, and argue for, then um, that's fine. In fact, that's what I often taught and believed up until just a few years ago when I came to a different understanding of sin and the blood of Jesus. So anyway, um, but now the way I look at it is that God has always forgiven all people of all their sins, past, present, and future. That's this charizomai forgiveness I was talking about. All right. However, that doesn't mean that we are free, that we have broken free, that uh, we have been delivered from our bondage and enslavery, enslavement and, and addiction to some of these horrible, harmful, destructive, damaging behaviors. All right. And so the blood of Jesus, the death of Jesus, reveals to us what we've done. It didn't buy forgiveness from God or, you know, purchase forgiveness from God. I've talked about that in previous podcast episodes. The blood of Jesus revealed to us. It was so important because nothing but the blood of Jesus could reveal this truth to us. That's why the blood of Jesus is so central to the gospel. Nothing could, could, could uh, reveal this truth to us. And so uh, that's why Jesus died. Anyway, and so once we see that, and see the truth, then we can start living free. We can be cleansed. 
uh, from uh, and experience the aphasis forgiveness, the actual practical deliverance uh, from this this bondage and slavery to sin. So, Debbie, I don't know if that sort of answers what your question there is. Yeah, I don't think I don't really subscribe to this mystical power of the blood of Jesus. I think the death of Jesus is more practical rather than magical or mystical. OK, and uh, so it um, it uh, helps us know how to live now in light of Jesus Christ and him crucified. As for what the Catholics believe about communion, I believe you're talking about what is it? Is it uh, now I just got the two terms mixed up. Is it transubstantiation or consubstantiation where the wine becomes the actual blood of Jesus? Uh, look, I, I'm not Catholic, so I, I don't have never even thought about this in, in light of the, the Catholic practice of communion. So, um, I don't really know what to say about that. I'll just leave that one alone. And, uh, Barbara left a couple of comments. Thank you, Barbara. Th- uh, I'm, I'm glad you found it as well. And Paula, uh, thanks, Jeremy. That really helped. Good. I'm glad that I'm glad you found that helpful, Paula. Um, Nancy, I love the eye contact. 